It is now time for one of the most popular segments we do here on the 605 Super Podcast, In the News. And of course, that means I need to welcome the anchor of the In the News desk, Mr. Jim Cornette. Thank you very much, Brian Last. We have... Oh, I I was about to say, (laughs) I was about to say in my newscaster voice, it will be my pleasure to bring you the news. Well, we'll see about that because we have some very interesting news here this week. And this first story, Jim, is from the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, Minnesota, February 16th, 1965. Assault charge filed in stabbing of wrestler race. John Morton was charged with aggravated assault Monday after allegedly stabbing professional wrestler Harley Race in the back during a fight in a Minneapolis restaurant Friday. Race told police that he was eating in the Chestnut Tree, 1370 Nicolette Avenue, when three men entered the restaurant. Police said that one of the men, Jack LaRue, 25, 591 Dayton Avenue, St. Paul, struck a woman in the face. Race, who was alone, interrupted and told LaRue to leave the woman, Peggy Hayden, 22, alone. The wrestler returned to his table, but a waitress informed him that one of the men had a knife, police said. Race walked over to the men, and when LaRue (laughs) cursed him, the wrestler hit LaRue, knocking him unconscious, police said. Morton, 25, address unknown, then allegedly stabbed Race. The wrestler was taken to the hospital and released after being treated police arrested Morton as he and a companion, Kenneth Alexander, 26 of 3609 2nd Avenue South, were carrying LaRue from the restaurant. Now, we always hear these stories, Jim, about the toughness of Harley Race. And here's an amazing example, because not only is he stabbed, but he's told there's a knife and he runs towards the knife. Well, no, I, I can I can see this situation. He saw this guy smack this girl, and he went over and, hey, leave this woman alone, right? And blah, blah, blah. And there was some words, and it, he went and sat back down, and the waitress came over and said, hey, one of them's got a knife. Oh, they do? Well, I'll take that fucking knife. And he just happened to knock the other one out first that didn't have the knife. But uh, I can believe he just calmly got up went back over there because they were probably mouthing off and here you go. Now I had heard, I don't know that that's the only time that Harley race got stabbed, uh, breaking up a beef in a restaurant. Uh, There may have been another one as well, but um, uh, you know, that's, he wasn't going to take any bullshit off any. And this was 1965. He was uh, not quite 30 at that point. Right. So uh, he was a, uh, he was even younger and tougher than (laughs) Uh, how many guys would do that, Jim? How many guys, you know, from that era today is obviously a different world altogether, but in, let's say the eighties, even how many guys if they were in a restaurant by themselves and they saw a commotion like that would actually get up and get involved. Uh, some of them, I mean, I can't just specifically call exact names, but, uh, you know, buddy Rogers, didn't he make the papers a couple years before he died for taking some guy down in a diner or something and, and fucking him up that was trying to rob the place or bothering people he was 71 or so i think at the time yeah you know i i mean it obviously would depend on the the venue and the uh the numbers but uh i wouldn't be surprised for a guy like harley of three on one he would do the old deal where he wanted to wait until a few more of them showed up to make it even how much time did you ever get to spend around Harley? I know he was there briefly in 1990. I know he was there in 85, but that may have been before you got in there. Did you get to spend much time around Harley during your career? Um, well, it, just every once in a while, at, at you know, most recently over the past 20 years or however many years at fan fests and et cetera. But I mean, he was in Greensboro one night as a special attraction while we were, yet had just got in for Crockett. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was, I mean, I didn't, sit down and take up all of his time, uh, his, his important, you know, boot lacing and cigarette smoking time to bend his ear. Like I would one of the boys that, you know, wouldn't knock me out. (laughs) But, (laughs) but I remember, you know, in that night in Greensboro, we were sitting near each other in the locker room and, and he was talking about, I I can't remember how it came up. He might've mentioned he had to have surgery on something and us. And I, he took my hand and put it on his kneecap. And that would sound, in anybody else but Harley, it would sound dirty. But he put it on his kneecap. It was like feeling a, bone, a, a bean bag. His kneecap wasn't in 
like a bone. It was like it was like it wasn't mushy. It was hard pebbles of shit, and his elbows were like pebbles of shit. And I'm like, what the fuck? Because uh, uh, he took all those bumps all those years. He took them exactly squarely and perfectly. But my God, he used to take that full flat back body slam on concrete. And, you know, uh, even as tough as he was, it, it you know, fucked up a lot of shit in there. But I, I was amazed he could still walk. And he was out there wrestling in one of the main events. I don't think I ever really truly appreciated Harley when I was younger until I saw the Mid-Atlantic tapes and I saw that match with him and Steamboat. Yeah. That really made me appreciate how, when he was just a little bit younger than when I first saw him, how he was able to move around. Well, and see, I had first seen him right about the time of the Mid-Atlantic films that were shot in the late 70s. I saw him 77 uh, was the first time I saw him live when he got the NWA title. And going back then, and it was a big deal, I remember, obviously, at the time, I saw him in Memphis, and he came, he came to Louisville against Rocky Johnson, Memphis against Rocky Johnson. Then I finally got to see him... Uh, in Atlanta against Tommy Rich and et cetera, over the couple of year period, right before he started slowing down in the eighties. Right. But when I go back now and look at the notes that I made from those matches, it's always the same thing. Best match I've ever seen Rocky Johnson have best match I've ever seen. Tommy, you know, best, it was him. And it, I wasn't quite familiar enough with his work to, to know what to, you know, what to expect, but it was, it was, and then his best stuff, physically was in the late 60s early 70s that's why they considered him as the guy to go between uh, funk and briscoe to begin with because he was one of the best workers in the world george shire recently was here on the show talking about just how good harley race and larry hennig were as a tag team and unfortunately there's very little if any footage of them together yeah i don't know if i it, it, i mean there might be some real flickery eight millimeter stuff out there but i don't know if i've ever seen a videotape of race and hennig Real quick before we move to the next story, you bring up Rocky Johnson. Obviously from Memphis Heat and from what I've been able to gather throughout the years, I know that he was, for a while there, a pretty good-sized star. But unlike a lot of the guys, Austin Idol, Jimmy Valiant, whoever it may be, who were in and out of there a lot throughout the years, it didn't seem like he came back that often. Just how big was Rocky Johnson in the Memphis territory? It's hard to explain in that he had great matches on top, he was pushed in the main event position, and... He drew, especially the first couple of times he was in. In 76, they actually did the boxer versus wrestler thing with him and Lawler to take off on, as Gomer would say, the Ali Inoki thing. And people bought that he was a boxer. And he came in, and they even had the match with by, and he wore boxers, shorts, and et cetera. And then suddenly he started wrestling, uh, and people accepted that too. Uh, but he drew, drew big houses, especially in Memphis. And, and it, I mean, it's no secret. They, they loved, in that era, black baby faces. Uh, Zulu against the Stomper. Stomper was so hot and Zulu looked so good, he sold out to Coliseum three weeks in a row. Uh, but Rocky, he was a great athlete and he could work and he could carry it. Um, he wasn't the outlandish promo that... that uh, that handsome Jimmy or Austin Idol or or even like Lawler or you know the other guys that got over to that level, and Dundee was the exception too. But he, he just he worked his ass off. But I think that Rocky Johnson in Memphis drew well based on his work while he was there, uh, and drew big houses, especially in Memphis. I mean, I'm not going to say that he you know fucking tore the house down in Louisville every time he was there, uh, as far as uh, the gate. But people don't remember the great angles that Rocky Johnson did because he never did those great promos. He never, he, you know, they remember whether on the heel side, they remember Austin Idol breaking the plaque over Lawler's head or LeDuc cutting his arm with the axe or the Tupelo concession stand brawl. They remember the, the Lawler Dundee, you know, because Dundee got his head shaved. None of the great angles involved Rocky Johnson or the great promos. So they really didn't show highlights of him when he wasn't there so much. And also they showed more highlights of the heels on TV anyway, because they would come back and either team with or fight Lawler again eventually. But Rocky was a baby face. So I think when he came back, he, he had another run in what was it, 1980, <laughs> that didn't do any business because nothing was doing any business because Lawler's leg was broken and he was gone. So that was kind of forgotten. And then they came back in the mid-80s after the Watts talent trade 
Uh, I think that's when they moved, when the Rock City moved from Hawaii to Nashville, and and you know it was like six four and fifteen years old in high school, and by then business was dodgy. So it was really at first run in seventy six and seventy seven. He was a he was a big star at a time and a main event guy at a time where business was doing pretty goddamn good anyway. Jim, as we move on to our next story, I want to make boy that was a long goddamn answer to that, wasn't it? It was a good answer though. <clears throat> well, I had to work it out in my head as you asked me because he just they didn't keep showing the tapes over and over. He wasn't while he was in big drawing programs with Lawler and other guys. He wasn't in these memorable angles that were saved on tape for so many years. And I think he just was a guy that, you know, didn't get replayed over and over. Jim, as we move on with our next story, I want to make mention that these stories have been pulled from Scott Teal's crowbar press archives on Facebook. I encourage anyone who enjoys wrestling history to check out his page. Great, great stuff. The crowbar press archives. But this next story is from Upland, California, December 4th, 1941. Belt put up as security. Upland, December 3rd. Bill Varga, 22, said to be the world's light heavyweight wrestling champion and two companions were at liberty today under $10 bail each following their arrest on charges of discharging firearms in the Upland city limits last night when they were hunting rabbits with the aid of a flashlight at 13th Street and Benson Avenue. Varga, who gave his address as 5406 Lexington Avenue, Hollywood, had with him at time of his arrest his championship belt, which he said he won Monday night at Hollywood Legion Stadium. He left the belt as security while he and his companions, Earl Patrick Hallinan, 21, of 1111.5 North Coronado Street, Los Angeles, and John Hallinan, 34, 2610 Scott Avenue, Los Angeles, drove to the metropolis to secure cash with which to post bail. The trio assertedly had bagged three rabbits when arrested. This is a young Count Billy Varga, obviously celebrating (laughs) his big championship win with this rabbit hunt at night. Jim, in general, um, and I know some places the wrestlers don't get to leave the arena with the belts, and in some places they do. What's the protocol in terms of what a wrestler is supposed to do with the belt, where they should bring it and where they shouldn't bring it? Well, you know, I don't know about these days, and it varies from company to company, but in the old days, if you won the belt, it was your responsibility. Put it in your bag and carry it around, and you better fucking have it when we need it, and you better give it back when when it's time. And that's obviously every time in the old days in the territories when they had a change of championship belts, it was usually when the last guy got mad about money and took off with it. Um, And I can't believe that that didn't happen in that Southern Junior Heavyweight title belt that I love so much that uh, Nick Goulish used from 1952 to 1976, and Lawler took it home with him when they got a new one and took it to an autograph session in Memphis years ago, and and somebody made off with it. Oh, my God. Yeah, but... um, but no, you and like I said, that's why sometimes belts would turn up <clears throat> missing and why a lot of collectors are happy today. But it was your responsibility. You took it and you carried it every night. It was like you were the champion. And obviously, in the territories, there wasn't a deposit like there was for the NWA belt. It was, you know, depending on the era, and I think the person 10 grand or 20 grand, or they finally Flair had put up 25, I think, or Crockett put it up for him probably. But in the territories for the regional belts, there usually wasn't a bond or a deposit. It was just it was your job if anything happened to it. And I would have to think that this Billy Varga would go on to be, what is this, 1941? In the late 40s and 50s, he'd be the, you know, one of the names in local Los Angeles wrestling and be a big star and on the TV and everything. But he's a 22-year-old kid with two other jack-offs. Out hunting rabbits with a flashlight and fucking guns while he's got the belt. He probably just won it and they went and got drunk. If the promoter, who was the promoter back then in LA? 41. That would be interesting. I don't know that off the top of my head either, but, yeah. but, but whoever it was would have not been happy and probably wasn't happy to see this in the newspaper. I'm wondering how quick Billy Varga lost that belt after this came out in the paper. That's a good question. Something I need to look into here. <laughs> In the follow the following week, Billy Varga loses championship. In Smoky Mountain Wrestling, what, did you have any rules in terms of guys who left with the belt, what they could and couldn't do, and what would cause you to blow up if you heard about something with the belt? 
Well, well, back in those days, the guys, as long as you brought it to the fucking show the next day, I mean, I have pictures myself of a variety of championship belts wrapped around a variety of female people that have been <laughs> close to me over the, the years. I don't care what you did with it on your own. I didn't, I don't think anybody was spunking on it like that one with Paige. Uh, but I didn't, as long as you brought it back and you had it there the next night and I didn't lose it forever. I, you know, I, I don't know of anything that anybody else had done with it. They left it in their fucking bags. Hey, what do you think about the idea that Kerry Von Eric carved his initials into the NWA belt? Oh, that way. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> He could have at least done it in a, a place where it wasn't on the main plate. It didn't show. He could have put like a monogram over on the end somewhere. But, uh, but uh, you know, it I, it meant a big deal to him or it meant a, a great deal to him. That was, you know, something his dad had always wanted. So I'm sure it meant a lot to him, but I don't think he needed to deface the plate over it. I still haven't found an answer to who was it that carved the word stooge into the front of the old North American title in Mid-South Wrestling. I still need to find out what happened there. But, uh, Jim... Our next story, let's go across the pond to Blackpool, England, January 4th, 1960. Burglar picks wrong home for break-in, Blackpool, England, UPI. John Rankin decided to break into the home of Dominic Pye, and that was his big mistake. Pye, who makes his living as a heavyweight wrestler, picked him up and put him to sleep. Pye said he used a three-quarter Nelson with a gentle press on one of the neck arteries. <laughs> Rankin was convicted of burglary and ordered jailed for five years. Boy, they don't fuck around in Blackpool, England, do they? I'll tell you, that gentle press on the neck arteries, <laughs> that's a very popular move amongst wrestlers when they deal with a burglar, I would assume. Well, and, and uh, still, I'm still going back to this sentence. Five years for breaking into a house, not stealing anything, and getting choked out with a fucking... English cravat for your fucking trouble. <laughs> I bet he never stole again. <laughs> he probably didn't. Um, you know, and I have a uh, pie is a a well known. Wasn't this is this the pie I'm thinking of that was a well known English shooter, British shooter? I or is don't this? Know. Uh, I don't know either. I don't know. But let's move on to our next story, Jim. Yes, let's move on since we don't know. <laughs> let's go to Baltimore, Maryland, December first, nineteen thirty eight. Police unmask golden terror of wrestling. Baltimore, December 1st, Associated Press. Unsympathetic police unmask the golden terror of wrestling shows as Robert Weatherly, Philadelphia, ringside weight with mask, 303 pounds. Weatherly was booked on an assault charge under his real name despite his protest that his mask and concealed identity were an important part of his box office appeal. The golden terror lost to Nick Campo Frida. In a match here, and his defeat was greeted by a barrage of pop bottles and other missiles. He roared defiance, and a spectator, Max Jacobs, said he was kicked in the chin by the enraged terror. Hearing was set for December 8th. I personally feel really bad for the Golden Terror here in this situation, asking the police, please, <laughs> please do not unmask me. This will kill my business, please. <laughs> And, 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 and now, but now we know that, uh, what wasn't, uh, wasn't Clyde Steves a golden terror in, in the forties or was he the golden Superman? No, that was Walter Podolak. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so, you know, it, a lot of, uh, I'm just glad he wasn't unmasked in, in fucking Nashville. Nick Goulas would have fired him. They never unmasked uh, Pat Malone by God when he was the green shadow. He was never unmasked. Uh, well, he, and not until he lost it in a match to Roy Welch. <laughs> <laughs> but the cops couldn't get his mask off, I bet. Pat was a salty old bastard. Jim, our next story. Let's get back to your old stomping grounds. Memphis, Tennessee, December 21st, 1943. Memphis sports writer Fall Guy for Lady Wrestler. Memphis, December 20th, Associated Press. Henry Reynolds. Commercial appeal sports writer saw a blonde lady lugging a huge parcel into the post office. Chivalrously, he volunteered his services. The weighty package taxed all of his 150 pounds, but he finally made it after three stops for breath. Then the blonde turned to her perspiring benefactor and said sweetly, Thanks, it was nice of you. Would you like to come out to the wrestling matches tonight? I'm Mae Young, the woman wrestler. <laughs> Well, that's an interesting way to sell some tickets. Ah, I bet she said more like, thanks, fuckface. <laughs> <laughs> I could have got it myself, but I'd rather have you do it. You want to come to the matches tonight? I'm Mae Young. 
<laughs> she's lucky he didn't mug her. Or well, I, yeah, the other I'm, way around, actually. I, I, I'm thinking yeah. is she's lucky that he didn't. She didn't accuse. <laughs> he's lucky she didn't accuse him of trying something with her, so she could mug him. That's right. Um, and it would have been his package that that got yanked around and carried in, stuck in a slot. 1943 women's wrestling in Memphis. Who was promoting, and what was the scene in Memphis in 43? Uh, it, you know what? I don't know that much. I know that Ed Wolf was the promoter in the late forties, early fifties, Les Wolf. I said Ed Wolf, Les Wolf. And he's the one that sold in 57 to, uh, Roy Roy Welch and, and and the Goulas Welch office. Uh, he, I don't know if he was there as far as, uh, as 1943, but Interesting that May Young, because Meltzer says nobody can find listings for her wrestling before 1940, because everybody says how she wrestled in, in 1939. Nobody, so she would have only been a pro for a couple of years at that point. Wow, a rookie, a young May Young here. Something but she still would have been wrestling at the Ellis Auditorium, and if Elvis was alive, actually he was alive, he would have probably been about fucking six years old or whatever at that point. He was probably sneaking in the Ellis Auditorium to watch Mae Young. Jim, for our next story, let's head up to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, February 7th, 1933. Toots Mont cleared. Yay! Toronto, Ontario, February 7th. Joseph Toots Mont, wrestler from Denver, Colorado, was acquitted here yesterday of responsibility in the death of Teresa Lucioni. Mont's conviction for criminal negligence in connection with an automobile accident was quashed by the appellate court here. I had never heard about this before. Did you know anything about this? Well, actually, yes. It was... My God, I've read so much research stuff over the last couple of years, but either it was in the Fall Guys or it was in... Of uh, the New York, the Madison Square Garden book that Scott Teal did, or it, somewhere that he was in the, I think it was as far back as as the maybe the late twenties, but this may have drug on for a while. But had been in an accident, and and some woman got killed, and that derailed some of his wrestling for a while. Obviously, Toots Mont later on would become partners with Vince McMahon Sr. in Capital Wrestling, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. But more importantly, he was a member of the Gold Dust Trio with Strangler Lewis and Billy Sandow and the man who invented the modern way of booking programs, finishes, angles, etc. And also, I, when I would write a column for the Raw magazine uh, under an assumed name because I was a heel manager on camera, I would write under the pen name Joseph T. Mont. I didn't know you wrote for the Raw magazine. I did when they wanted people who knew how to spell and fucking write proper articles. Yes, I did. Well, obviously, you know, beyond the Gold Dust Trio, as a wrestler, how big was Toots Mont? How big of a draw was he? Was he a big star in the places he went? I, well, I mean, he was one of the guys, from what I've read, just from the books that I've read, and obviously there's no film or whatever the fuck, but he was a, a fairly big name when it was just barnstorming wrestlers. There was no structured offices. He was part of developing booking offices, but he was pretty well thought of as being a pretty fair wrestler, but he wasn't at the top level either in box office appeal or in actual you know, Ray, he wasn't the best guy. He was used as like a policeman in some cases, I think, in, in his early days before he got in, where he was he was a pretty fair fucking wrestler, but he wasn't a box office draw and he wasn't Strangler Lewis. So he found his niche in the uh, behind the scenes. To any of the listeners who are not really familiar with him, you said that he invented modern booking, etc. What do you mean? Um, it, it, it was his idea to come up with fluke and or uh, disputed finishes that led to rematches. It was his idea that these wrestlers could take this match, especially in the days before communication and even before a lot of people had radio, for fuck's sake. They could take the match from town to town and nobody would be any the wiser if they did the same shit or just book the same matches. Uh, The idea of working programs with each other came from that. The idea of building up you not only your champion, but also the top challengers with wins over different people and, and in an organized fashion so that they would meet in a big match. Um, a lot of that came from Toots Mont. Slam bang Western wrestling is what he called the style. 
We'll talk a little bit more about Toots Month in a moment, but let's get to our next story, Jim. New York City, January 24th, 1958. Matt Ban for Arena. New York, New York International News Service. The New York Athletic Commission Friday indefinitely banned all professional wrestling exhibitions at St. Nicholas Arena. The suspension stemmed from the commission's investigation into a riot during Wednesday's show in which two men were sent to the hospital. One fan was struck in the eye by part of a broken chair. Six police cars and an ambulance were summoned when fistfights broke out in the crowd. (laughs) During a spirited tag match between Chris and John Tolos and Pat O'Connor and Chief Red Cloud. The commission said that after studying the report of the deputy commissioner in charge of the wrestling show and accounts in the press, we are satisfied that disorderly incidents occurred in violation of our rules covering such situations. Disorderly incidents occurred in violation of our rules covering such situations. That is a very ambiguous statement. Anyway, (laughs) the show scheduled for Tuesday, January 28th was canceled and subsequent shows suspended at least until such time as we are completely convinced that those who promote wrestling there are able to do so in the interests of the public and within our rules, unquote. (laughs) Man, can you imagine how much heat there was in New York at this time? This is just a few months after the riot at Madison Square Garden which led to children under the age of 14 being banned from Madison Square Garden until the 1970s. And here's a riot. A poor guy gets hit in the eye with a part of a broken chair. (laughs) Six police cars, an ambulance, and a partridge in a pear tree. And, well, Toots Mont's slam-bang Western-style wrestling. New York had been dark. Remember, there was no wrestling in Madison Square Garden from 1939 until 1951. And even though they had kept up the small clubs, St. Nicholas Arena and and Queens and uh, Jamaica and all those little uh, arenas that you see the ads for, they obviously weren't drawing any big money because they weren't in the big building. And and those buildings, you know, they were clubs. If you worked the New York area in the 1940s, like Jim the Black Panther Mitchell, you would be in those little clubs and boroughs in those buildings that seated 500 or 1,000 or 1,500. It was like old boxing arenas. So there wasn't big money in wrestling in New York at that time because the 30s had been the exposés. Dan Parker and the Daily Mirror and the publishing of the Fall Guys, and it was all out in the New York papers. And I've just brought this up on Twitter just uh, not long ago that the old newspaper articles of the late 50s covering the garden shows, the garden is selling out, rock and prez are turning them away, 20,000 fucking people, but the papers are always still making the snide comments. You know, the the hokum and the hilarity and, you know, casting the role of the victor and all that stuff. Because of 20 years earlier, everybody in New York still knew that wrestling was, well, the newspapers wouldn't let you forget that wrestling was bullshit, which is why I think on reflection, not that I'm trying to get too deep here, When they revived wrestling in the garden, they tried with Luthez and Gorgeous George off the TV and didn't fucking work, right? Right. Vern threw 4,000 people. Vern Gagne off Chicago TV didn't fucking work. Luthez. What worked? Rocca. Then what worked? Rocca and Perez. And Buddy Rogers, I mean, in any era, Buddy Rogers was huge. But then Bruno. Then Pedro. They set the tone. Rocca set the tone for the idea that New York always needed an ethnic hero on top. The ethnic hero or the the ethnic population, the Puerto Ricans, the Hispanics, the the Italians, a lot of them weren't reading the newspapers. Do you think that Atlanta and, and, and the garden suddenly became, do you think that there was any other event held at Madison Square Garden that had such a percentage of Hispanics and Italians and immigrants in general? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Fez failed. Uh, uh, Gorgeous George failed. Uh, Vern Gagne didn't get over in New York, but the ethnic stars did because it had been trashed in the papers, but the ethnic audiences weren't reading the English language papers. So then did that even after that would have no longer been an issue, then the, the, the die was cast that New York would always have an ethnic star on top for the next 30 fucking years. The tag team that started this riot, or at least caused the riot, Chris and John Tolis. You know, Bob Barnett grew up in New York, and he told me that when he saw them at that time, he loved them because they were like Neanderthals. 
And you yeah. see those pictures of them, and you, I understand yeah. what he was saying. And I never got to see any young John Tolis, or at least a little bit. There's some footage out there, but he said that they were a dynamic tag team back oh, then. Oh, well, and well, you can tell from John Tolis's work that you can see on tape when he was 50 how he could go and that what kind of shape he was in. And so, and I've seen some old Tolo stuff from the sixties on some of these stray VHSs or whatever that I've, and they were just in good shape, perpetual motion could go. And then Tolos had the big mouth, but he never got to be a star. And the Tolos brothers were a big team in the fifties when, you know, there's no video available. He never got to be a, a, a star on his own until that run with Blassie in Los Angeles. And by that point, Blassie's an old man and Tolis is much older yeah. than, you know, he was obviously when he was in his prime. Yeah, but at least, but see, Tolos was, he could talk. They both could talk and Tolos was still in shape where he could carry the, that part of it. But yeah, the Tolos said they were big in the, in the Carolinas as a team. They were big in the New York area there. And, and that's where I was going with that also is you talked about all the heat. Tootsmont's slam bang Western style wrestling. Once he got in, they figured out the, the, Ethnic stars and the Gaga and, and the heat. That's how they got New York back and almost lost it, obviously, as you can see from there, because this is a time where they were selling the garden out constantly every month and St. Nicholas Arena and all those clubs. They were all fucking huge. Well, they had to get the garden back for a reason. And for that reason, let's go to our next story. New York, New York, January 3rd, 1934. <laughs> Wrestlers, promoters called for quiz January 9th. New York, January 3rd. Toots Mont, Dick Schickat, Strangler Lewis, and Rudy Miller, wrestlers, and Jack Curley and Ed White, promoters, have been issued subpoenas to appear before the New York Boxing Commission here January 9th following an attack on the mat game as it is conducted by Jack Pfeffer. Pfeffer appeared before the Boxing Commission yesterday and presented a statement attacking the sport and was put under oath, repeating his statement, which named the wrestlers and promoters. Well, there it is. And, you know, here on this episode of the Super Podcast, we're talking about the Knoxville Five tape of guys threatening to expose the business. Here's Jack Pfeffer, who exposed the business and still lived in the business for another 30-something years. But this is a pretty major story here, right, Jim? Well, this started the whole thing. And, and we just read in February 1933, Mont got cleared in the auto accident, but he's back January of 1934. He's already obviously heavily figured in with, with Lewis. And this was when, uh, was this when they had already split up with Sandow or on the outs with Sandow and Jack Curley was involved as yeah, a promoter? That's what I was thinking too. Uh, yeah. But, um, and Dick Schick had, of course, was a former world champion. Rudy Miller was probably another guy like Toots Mont. That, if Toots Mont would put uh, Strangler Lewis over, Rudy Miller's the guy that put Schick at over, and then the you would have your big Schick at Lewis match. But anyway, Rudy Miller would later on go to be the promoter in Pittsburgh. Jack Pfeffer couldn't get his way so he exposed the business to the commission who back then had no fucking idea what was going on with wrestling even the boxing and wrestling commission didn't know because this was one of the first legitimate and widespread exposés ever of exactly how things were done and it came in new york <clears throat> and then when pfeffer you know couldn't get his way he was apparently the person that was suspected of being the source that was feeding information to the Dan Parker at the Daily Mirror and the newspapers and the sports pages to expose wrestling in New York. And that's where Pfeffer made his reputation for the next 30 years. He would go from territory to territory, book my girls or book my guys or book whoever I'm managing. And if you don't, I'll expose the business. And Jack Pfeffer was managed Don and Jackie Fargo when they were the top team in in New York in the late fifties. I don't know if he was allowed to go to the matches, but he got a cut. He would get them booked places and the, whether it be Nashville or whether, whether he got over so good or whether it be New York where they were great for rock and Perez and or Ohio. Cause that way they could learn from buddy Rogers, but Pfeffer would get a cut of their money, but he kept them booked everywhere. I just talked to uh, Ron Fuller actually about it because his father, buddy Fuller was a world champion for Jack Pfeffer as I think was a buddy, buddy Valentine. Was that it? Because Johnny Valentine was big in Chicago and they were running kind of outlaw fucking revamp of Chicago there in what, 62, 63? Yeah. When Fred Kohler was either, he had lost all his pull and his money or he was out entirely. 
that was the end of Fred Kohler. Fred Kohler yes. brought Jack Pfeffer in, and Jack Pfeffer destroyed it to the point where Vern and Bruiser and Snyder were able to go in there and buy everything. That's right. And, uh, but, <laughs> but that, this was, you know, 30 years before that. Jack Pfeffer was doing the same thing, but this led to the exposés, the newspaper coverage, and led to no wrestling on a major league basis in New York City for 12 years. Well, for our final story, and I think you'll see where we're going with this, you and I on the experience sometimes talk about money then versus money now. So for this story, and to find out a little bit about what was going on in that in-between period, let's go to Hollywood, California, December 15th, 1942. Film and sport notables facing tax prosecution. Hollywood, December 15th. United Press. A score of screen and sports figures were named today in federal liens asking payment of allegedly delinquent income taxes. Blonde Madeline Carroll, however, sued the government for deductions. Her suit, the only one against the government among the tax disputes, said she was the sole support of 51 French war orphans who were quartered in her home <laughs> outside Paris from 1936 to 1939. Prince David Medvani, last of the marrying Medvanis who was inducted into the army last week, was asked to pay $1,488. William Cagney, producer and brother of James Cagney, assertedly was delinquent $8,023.58. Mr. and Mrs. Alan Mowbray were named for $22.27.15 apiece. Singer Jack Dawn and Mrs. Dawn were asked to pay, and all the little Dawns were asked to pay $2,404.72 each. Misha Auer, the Russian comedian, allegedly owed $11,500.22 from his 1941 income. John R. Osborne, prominent racetrack figure, was short $62,000. $146.42 on 1939 taxes, according to the suit. Wrestler Toots Mont, good God, he's everywhere, was asked for $18,000. Director Ray Carey, allegedly delinquent, $1,213. Actress Phyllis Brooks, $37.51. Ruth Chatterton, $114. Makeup artist Purse Westmore, 3015. Producer Harry Eddington, 6857. And comedian Patsy Kelly, $4,374. I hate that Patsy couldn't handle her money. $18,000 in 1942. $265,000 today. Just that he was in delinquent, delinquency on and taxes, and that. This is. Is this just for 1941? Well, it doesn't say Oh, no, that. it doesn't say, okay. Yeah. Well, Osborne was short on, and this is the racetrack fucking figure, prominent racetrack figure. I wonder what his real line of work was. <laughs> $62,000 short on his 1939 taxes. I got to get my inflation calculator back up here. <laughs> well, just figure that's a million dollars that he didn't pay. But uh, uh, Tootsmont, okay, yeah, 18 grand worked out to what? 265000 this was 1942. We know he had been in L.A. Had been 10 years previously, even if that was for fucking a number of years. But a lot of, you know, this apparently they wouldn't let you get too far. I see everything from 1939, 1940, 41. And that's what he had to apparently tell them that he made. No, and, that's what he said. That's what he owed. That's not what he made. No, I'm saying that's that's what he that's on what he had to tell them that he actually made. How much did he really make and not because fucking wrestling? How many how many incidents happened that he just got a suitcase of cash handed to him and said, see you later and never declared it to begin with. So he was making some fucking money. And he, I, I have no reason to dispute a lot of the advertising and publicity and and etc back in those days of the 20s and 30s when they said what the world champion would ask for and get as a guarantee because the whole thing was built around it wasn't like a wrestling card it was like can we get strangler lewis to come to the town and defend his world title and we're going to sell tickets to it and we're all going to get rich and he'd get half the fucking gate or whatever so i mean those guys were fucking it was a license to print money I didn't realize just how much money someone like Tootsmont at that point in 42 would have been making. It's really extraordinary. Well, and think about when, when um, the, the story, so the story goes that to get 
Lewis to agree to drop the belt, the origination of every all the double crosses that led to the original Montreal double cross. Didn't Paul Bowser put up seventy grand to yeah. get the world champion on Ed or world title on Ed Don George? That's approximately what a million dollars today. A little that's over about a million. A, I'll yeah. give you this million dollars to let me let my guy win the belt from you so that I can make money with it, and then when I give it back to you, you know I, I, what the fuck. That was a lot of fucking money. Yeah. Our wrestling money did not uh, evolve with the times like uh, other sports did. Certainly not, but uh, either did this show. So as we begin <laughs> to wrap things up, Jim, any final words to the listeners of the Super Podcast? Yes. Don't trust Jack Pfeffer. Thank you. Fuck you and bye. <laughs>